I'm very grateful to you, Lee, and to the Riding Association for inviting me today, and to you all for being here also today. I feel very privileged as a member of Parliament to be able to discuss uh, the matters and principles that unite us as Conservatives. As you may know, my journey in politics has been somewhat uh, bumpy. <laughs> but I very much enjoy my most recent role as an MP. It gives me uh, more time to visit constituency association and to meet people like you. It also gives me more time to think and uh, to think about policy and even to write and talk about it, which is impossible when you have very heavy responsibilities. And uh, I started abroad almost a year ago, where you can see YouTube uh, video, videos of me discussing monetary policy and uh, various other topics. I believe I'm the only MP on Ottawa to run such a blog. All the others understand that it is useless to try to compete with funny videos of cats and dogs and Hollywood <laughs> celebrities. <laughs> Whatever you've read in the newspaper, the first things you should know about me is that I'm, com I'm from the Beauce. And uh, the Beauce is the region along the river uh, Chaudière, south of Quebec City. And like uh, Lee just uh, told you, it's, uh, it's a very well-known region in Quebec. And it is the most entrepreneurial region of the province. This is where I learned the values that go with entrepreneurship, individual freedom, personal responsibility, integrity, and self-reliance. Because I often talk about these, value, these values, um, I've been called by the media and described by the media as the Alberton from Quebec. <laughs> and I can tell you that this is a compliment. <laughs> I, and, I wish, and I wish the media was always this nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they are also universal values, values that are the core of Western civilization and are shared by millions of Canadians. Values that have made this country prosperous and a great place to live. And I believe you will agree with me, they very much are conservative values. Values that distinguish us from our political opponents. When a problem arises, our opponents think that more government intervention is always the solution. And as Ronald Reagan once said, these people tend to see the role of government in three steps. If it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. And if it stops moving, subsidize it. <laughs> For us conservatives, on the contrary, government should ideally set up and enforce the basic rules of life in society and then leave individuals free to cooperate among themselves to provide for their wants. Good government should not intervene to solve each and every problem on the road to a utopian and unrealist unrealistic vision of society. To paraphrase uh, John F. Kennedy, from a conservative perspective, don't ask what your government can do for you. Ask your government to get out of the way <laughs> so that you can be free. Yes, you can be free to take responsibility for yourself, for your family, and for everyone else that you care about. Good government policy gives individual the opportunity to dreams and to realize their dreams. It does not impose the dreams of some on everyone. And I went into politics to defend this kind of policy. But now 
let's face it, these uh, perspectives based on freedom, personal responsibility, and self-reliance is not that fashionable nowadays. Over the past hundred years, government has grown to gigantic proportion. It intervenes in almost every aspect of our lives. It tries to plan economic development. It tells us if we may or may not cut down a tree on our own property. It takes care of us from the cradle to the grave. But we got to a situation now where every child that is born is already burdened with tens of thousands of dollars in debt. And if you take all levels of government into account, about half the wages of working people in this country goes to fund all this government intervention. So why did, did this happen? Economists and political scientists who belong to a school of thought called public choice have tried to explain this uh, dynamic. Their research shows uh, particular groups have a strong interest in getting organized to put pressure on politicians. These special interest groups want subsidies, trade protection, more generous social programs, a fiscal or legal privilege, regulation that favors them and keeps out competition. Any favor they get from the government can potentially bring them huge benefit. Of course, each of us, each of us will have to pay for it. But in our case, the amount we pay for each measure is not significant enough to justify getting organized to oppose it. You won't go to meetings and demonstrate in the street to oppose a particular program that will cost you $10. But the small group of people who get a hundred million dollars have a huge interest in getting organized. And you know it, it's very hard. It's very hard for politicians to say no to these lobbies because they have the means to hijack debates, quickly mobilize support, and fuel controversies in the media. On the other end, nobody hears what the silent majority has to say. Even if they are the ones paying the bill. So there is a fundamental imbalance in political debates. On one side, you have concentrated benefits to special interest group who have a strong incentive to do their lobbying. And on the other side, you have dispersed costs that fall on society at large. That's how government grows and grows. And that's how we become less and less free and more and more dependent on government. So what should we do as conservatives to reverse this trend? One way to change the terms of the debate would be to announce that the government will not, is not going to grow anymore. I know that we are going to, ver to or that we are going to some very difficult and tough economic circumstances, and that this is not a realistic proposal for the coming budget. But let's try a thought experiment. Last year, the federal government's total expenses were about two hundred and fifty billion dollars. You can do a lot of things with $250 billion. <laughs> and from an historical perspective, this is a gigantic amount of resources. What if we decided that this is more than enough, that expenses are not going to grow anymore, 
And I'm not saying zero growth adjusted for inflation and population or GDP and Greece increase. Just zero growth. The overall budget is frozen at 250 billion. From now on, any government decision has to be taken within this budgetary constraint. Every new government program or increase in an existing program has to be balanced by a decrease somewhere else. We no longer have debates about how much more the government, how much more generous the government can be with this or that group as if the money belonged to the government instead of taxpayers. The Senate majority's interests are always being protected. The focus of the debate is shifting to a determination of priorities. What are the most important tasks for the government to achieve with the money we have? Is this government function really important? And should we have more of it? Then should we, uh, what then should we do less or stop doing and leave in the hands of the free market, voluntary organization, an individual citizen. That would be quite a chance, quite a, chan uh, a chance, a change, a change, a change, yeah. <laughs> Don't you think? I think it would be a very big change for our country. But a commitment, a commitment to zero budget growth could become a um, powerful symbol of fiscal conservatism just like the no deficit consensus was to some extent until the advent of the global economic crisis. But the consequences would be much deeper. It would mean that every year the relative size of the government would be smaller. It will force politicians, bureaucrats, lobbyists, and everybody else to stop thinking that your salaries are just there to grab for their own benefit. And because of the budgetary constraint, Canadians will have a lot more confidence that we're not wasting their money. So we have to convince people. We have to convince them that we're not simply aiming to be better managers of a bigger government. We are aiming to be better managers of a smaller government. There is a large constituency out there for these uh, small government principles, but because there are no lobbies to defend them, they get lost in the debates. We have to act as the lobby of the silent majority. The silent majority who are tired of working to pay for special interests. The Senate majority who are dismayed at seeing their freedom curtailed at every turn. The Senate majority who are losing hope that life will get better for them and their children. It is not always possible, of course. There are political realities that cannot be overlooked. But being pragmatic is not enough. In the long run, there are political gains to be made by telling people the hard truth, and not just what they want to hear, or what is politically correct, and not just telling it, doing it too. We have to justify our actions on the basis of these principles. And when I was industry minister, Michels know that. I was asked to support a new tariff on bicycle. There was a big Canadian manufacturer, big Canadian uh, bicycle manufacturer that could not compete with bicycles made in Asia and threatened to lay off workers. So in order to save over a hundred jobs, the solution was to force all those young Canadians buying a new bicycles 
to pay $67 more. There was a big Canadian manufacturer, big Canadian uh, bicycle manufacturer that could not compete with bicycles made in Asia and threatened to lay off workers. So, in order to save over a hundred jobs, the solution was to force all those young Canadians buying a new bicycles to pay $67 more. That will have made all these uh, Canadian families poor just to benefit a particular industry. And I said no, even though the manufacturer was in my own writing in the Bose. The free market is not just an abstract concept that you mention when it is politically expedient and that you forget when it is not. If you want people to believe you, you have to put your principles in practice. I can tell you that people understood that in my writing. They respected my decision because they knew why I had taken it. They could see that every time it was possible, I would defend the interest of the silent majority instead of particular interests. And in the long term, they would benefit more. The confrontation between interest groups and the silent majority was again the central theme in what was by far the most important file I handled as a minister, telecommunication deregulation. Contrary to what you often hear, industry regulation rarely, rarely protects ordinary citizens. It usually protects some favored players at the expense of others, and in particular at the expense of consumers. Getting rid of obsolete and costly regulation in this crucial sector for our economy proved a lot more difficult than I thought. I had to face opposition from groups and businesses who benefited from current rules. But the strongest opposition came from my own civil servant at Industry Canada. Bureaucrats don't like it when they lose their influence and their power to regulate. It was quite a fight. I had a very good team, and I want to thank Michelle Austin, my chief of staff. <clears throat> but in the end, we carried out, carried out what some observer considered the most important reform <coughs> thanks Michelle, of the telecommunication sector in several decades. <clears throat> it brought more competition, more choices, lower prices for Canadian consumers. As you know, politicians as a group are way down the list, way down the list in terms of public confidence. I think one reason people are so cynical is that they do not believe us. They don't perceive us as defending clear goals and principles or acting on these principles. But if you are here today, if you are here this morning, it's because you don't share this cynicism. The reason you are involved in a political party is that you want to make a better world for yourself, for your family, for your community, for all Canadians. You believe it is possible and you are looking for ways to make it happen. I certainly would not be here today if I did not passionately believe in those ideals. Not after everything I went through two years ago. It will not be worth it. So, I'm offering you a challenge today. Let's restore together public confidence in politics. Let's redouble our efforts to defend the principles of individual freedom, personal responsibility, 
and smaller government. I don't think there is any other way to reach our goals if we want, if we want conservative principles to win the battle we have to defend them openly with passion and with conviction <laughs> and what could be wrong with giving a voice to the silent majority of Canadians who believes in these principles after all in silent majority there's the word majority thank you